So today we have a great speaker. Uh, I happened to watch the uh, proceedings at the city council a few weeks ago, and uh, Robin James did a very good job of presenting to council some ideas about how to uh, make things better for people that is in need of housing. So without any further ado, I would like to invite her up and, and tell us all about it. Give her a warm mic, thank you. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Robin James, I'm the CAO for Lethbridge Housing Authority and also Lethbridge and Region Community Housing Corporation. Uh, Lethbridge Housing Authority is the housing management body um, funded under the province of Alberta and Lethbridge and Region is a not-for-profit affordable housing provider that we created um, as a necessity to uh, build more affordable housing here in Lethbridge. So I was invited today after the um, council presentation on um, supportive housing actually. I was looking to repurpose a couple of buildings, uh, do some land zoning changes and uh, do a new uh, definition called supportive housing unrestricted for our city. And we did uh, receive a great amount of flack and feedback that wasn't particularly positive and so I think it's really um, a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to stand here before you and get out the right information and make sure that uh, we're all presenting things in a way that um, informs people and makes us understand the housing continuum and what we have in Lethbridge and what we're missing and why do we see our housed people continue to fall into homelessness? And why do we see generations at our homeless shelter? It's just an atrocity when you get someone uh, that comes to you and uh, you house them and their child is at the shelter. You know, So what needs to change? So that's what we're talking about today, who we are, what we do, and what we need to change here in the city. So. On the screen here, many of you may have seen is a housing continuum. So I'm um, just going to get to my notes here. Uh, in Lethbridge, <coughs> we fall specifically, Lethbridge Housing Authority comes in on where you see the community housing piece on that more left side and the affordable housing piece. Can you, okay? Can you read them out? Okay. Yes, I can. So on the, far, on the far, my right, your left side, is the homeless, the unsheltered homeless individuals that are living rough. Those are our tent city folks. Those are our individuals we're seeing primarily in our downtown core. Um, they are sneaking into warm spaces, trying to keep warm. They are completely unsheltered individuals. The next step over, we move to our emergency shelter, which is located just over our 9th Street Bridge there. Um, currently, it's operated. We just got a new operator, effective uh, January 2nd. It's operated now by the Blood Tribe Public Health Department. So super exciting new changes there, and we are just excited for them and all the opportunities that they can provide for our homeless individuals. So super, super new, super exciting new step. Next to the emergency shelter, we have transitional housing, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more as the presentation goes on. As we move through the housing continuum, we move to more of a supportive housing piece, and again, I'll explain what those are as we continue through this conversation. After supportive housing, we move into the community housing space, which is where Lethbridge Housing um, exists. That's our ministerial order. That's, what, that's our existence point. After community housing, community housing is, an, is and I'll, I'll explain more later, but it's a rent geared to income. So it's not affordable to the market, it's affordable to the tenant. So it doesn't matter if the market dictates a $1,000 a month rent, theirs is based on what they can afford to pay. Okay? We move into affordable housing and that's what the market says is affordable. Okay? And then we move over to, um, after affordable, we move into market housing, and of course there's home ownership and all of those other great things. So, who Lethbridge Housing is? Uh, Lethbridge Housing Authority strives to provide safe, secure, and affordable housing to all those in need in our community. LHA believes in building healthy families and sustainable communities with appropriate and affordable homes. Not just shelter, homes. 
we recognize that housing is more than just bricks and mortar. LHA is a respected partner in a uh, partner engaged in building vibrant communities through th strong partnerships. We currently partner with several organizations in order to address the complex social needs behind housing stability and homelessness in Lathbridge. So some facts about LHA and, and uh, lots of times people say, I've been on that wait list. I, I applied with Lethbridge Housing. I've been on that wait list for a year. You won't help me. Why won't you help me? We're, we're very highly um, regulated, as you can see. Lethbridge Housing operates under a ministerial order to deliver housing on behalf of the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services, which, by the way, is a brand new ministry. We're very, very excited about this ministry. This ministerial change brings housing and homelessness together under the same minister for the first time in Alberta. Very exciting. For the first time in my memory, maybe Bob might remember another time, but I, I sure can't. Uh, but uh, very exciting times. It means that housing continuum is flowing through the same person with the same direction. So we're pretty, we're pretty excited about that. Some legislation that we must follow, the housing accommodation tenancy regulations, some uh, management body regulations, rent supplement regulations, social housing regulations. This tells us who goes in the house first, um, how much their rent is, how many bedrooms they uh, can use. Um, it tells us when kids can share rooms, when kids can't share rooms, lots of different things. Um, lots of legislative pieces. Um, there is some changes coming to SHAR that actually, or the Social Housing Accommodation Regulation, effective January 1st, um, and it actually starts to prioritize our marginalized populations. So we are very excited about those changes. So these are all of the um, things that we must follow, and of course the Residential Tenancies Act, because you're still getting a lease agreement when you come into Lethbridge Housing. Uh, Lethbridge Housing um, and Lethbridge Region Housing, uh, we have uh, 403 self-contained units for age 50 plus. So the more well-known buildings people will know, of course, is Halmrest Manor, uh, located by the library, Hag Tower, which is a very um, large building, 136 units located over by the provincial building. And uh, Hardy Manor is our building located on the far end of the south side by Rona. Then we have uh, scattered site community housing. So community housing is for our families. They're the two, three, four, five bedroom housing. We have 273 of those units, um, primarily uh, in North Lethbridge and West Lethbridge. We do have some in South Lethbridge, uh, but very few. Through Lethbridge and Region Community Housing, we have a 96 affordable housing um, units. Our most recent build was 64 units um, at Southgate, the Southgate Boulevard properties, if anyone kind of lives over there. Uh, that was a CMHC uh, uh, grant funding agreement. It's very green, it's very vi environmentally friendly, it has a lot of solar panels. People are divided about the solar panels, but it provides safe and affordable housing for our seniors age 65 plus. We also have an additional 87 affordable housing units that we partner with Canadian Mental Health Association on. So we provide the bricks, the mortar, the support um, for maintenance and placements, and Canadian Mental Health provides the um, wraparound support for that client in need of mental health supports. As of November 30th, our current wait list for those units and our rent supplement program was 711. Okay, so lots, lots and lots of need out there in our community. LHA also offers a rental assistance program. Uh, our budget, our current budget, we actually just got an increase, so yay for that. Uh, so 2023 has got an extra, uh, I think, $150,000 in there. So the rental assistance benefit in the city of Lethbridge right now um, is helping 535 households in the private landlord market with, with a supplement given to the client to help pay their rent. So depending on if you're a single person, your supplement can be up to $400, but if you're a family, your supplement can be over 600. Okay, so it just depends on what your needs are in the community. The rental supplement offered by the government of Alberta is a long-term rental supplement uh, benefit. 
We do ask for a copy of your lease, but it is paid directly to the tenant so the tenant can pay their landlord. So that allows the tenant to learn budgeting skills. It also makes it so that um, when they're applying for housing, they're not those people that the government needs to support. They're getting that money, they're paying their landlord, they're doing well. Um, households are, are prioritized based on need, on all that legislation that we had talked about. Uh, we renew them annually, so once a year they bring in the documentation to prove that they're still in need and uh, we continue to fund them. There's no um, limit to this funding, there's no timeline. Okay. The next uh, benefit is a brand new benefit. It just came out this in 2022. It's called a temporary rental assistance. And it was to help stabilize families that were uh, lower income or between jobs. So we found that individuals who just needed a little bit of a hand up, we could never quite get to them. They were always on our wait list, they always needed help, but we just couldn't get to them because our point scores weren't high enough. <coughs> so this particular benefit um, is provided to individuals who are employed or have been employed in the last 24 months and they're not receiving government supports. So they're, they're trying to make it without those additional supports on their own. This again is paid directly to the tenant. It's based on their household size, but it has um, only a two year limit on that uh, funding agreement, okay? So it's, it's a hand up and it's temporary. So that's us, that's housing. So a lot of questions arise around how do, how do the two intersect? So the current context today is the city of Lethbridge is the community-based organization that is task 10 to homelessness in our city. The community-based organization in, in our city um, acts as a systems planner using provincial funds to determine need and establish priorities in our community and align them with uh, provincial homeless strategies. The goal of the CBO, the city has been the CBO since Bob would know better than me, 20 years, 25 years, Bob? Yeah. Uh, so the goal of the, uh, the CBO is to create systems by funding programs that ensure citizens' experience of homelessness is brief and non-reoccurring. Okay, so their job is to take them on that far side of that housing continuum and then Lethbridge Housing steps in kind of in the middle. How, they, how the city does this is they fund uh, funding will be directed to housing with appropriate supports, um, prevention, diversion, and outreach services. So, City of Lethbridge is homelessness, Lethbridge housing is housing. Separate. So let's go back to our housing continuum and, and see where our problems lie in the City of Lethbridge and why my presentation was taking place. So when we look currently at our homeless population in accordance with the um, last pit count, so this was the most recent one, we recognize that there's 454 people that in our community that are homeless. I think the 2019 count was 273, okay, pre-COVID. So it's pretty significant, it's quite a change. Um, in 2018, when they did that last that last count, only seven people identified that they were unsheltered. So in that far, far, my right, your left category, seven people in our community said, I have nowhere to go, I don't go to the shelter, I am indeed homeless. At this last account, 254 people identified as unsheltered in our city. So when you're wondering why, why am I seeing 10 cities? Why am I seeing encampments? Why am I 254 people identified as completely on that far side of that continuum? Okay. In 2018, 136 people were in our emergency shelter. 75 people were provisionally accommodated and five people we didn't know. In 2022, we had 92 people at the shelter. We had 108 in transitional housing. Now I'd like to take a moment to pause. The Lethbridge Housing Authority wait list with 711 people on it, less than 2% of our wait list identify as homeless. So it's not even the clients we serve. So 454 people are identified in our city and less than 2% of our wait list is homeless. 
So we're trying to find those gaps, identify those gaps, and fix those gaps as quickly as possible. So when we talk about homeless individuals, we're talking about homeless individuals that are couch surfing and are hidden homeless. They're living in hotels, they're living in campgrounds, they're living in encampments, or they're sleeping rough. And, they're, and primarily, we're seeing them in our downtown core. I know there's one gentleman that seems to be over by um, Costco and whatnot every time I go there. I don't know if you've seen him. So at the emergency shelter level, uh, currently, Blood Tribe Public Health has 80 beds there. So again, 454, so we have 80 beds there. The YWCA has 24 beds for women or, fem or, or individuals that identify as female. And Woods Homes has eight beds for youth. So our emergency shelter system has 112 beds. Our transitional housing, the next step over, um, consists of housing from a Fresh Start Treatment Centre. So our treatment centre just out on the jail road there. They currently have 23 beds and they have another 50 beds under construction that will be open very, very soon, so that's exciting. We have Southern Elkhair Manor in the downtown core that has 25 beds. We have Parkside that's operated by Streets Alive that has 18 beds. Blood Tribe Public Health at the uh, shelter has another 30 beds that are transitional. And of course, we have the Chinook Regional Hospital and the Lethbridge Correction Center. So those are the places where you can get some transitional housing. So you can see how limited this can be. On the supportive housing side, so to identify some supportive housing that we see in our city, Streets Alive, again, um, has 44 units there. Primarily, they're men's units. Um, for those individuals that are seeking um, a sober life. Uh, SASHA, Southern Alberta Self-Help Association, has 11 beds. The YWCA has 24 beds. YWCA Hestia, Hestia House, which is more their young people beds, they have nine beds there. And then we have this organization called River House um, that's operated through Family Ties that has nine beds for men. So you can see as you're coming through this housing continuum, We've got a huge lot in that far side, and then we skinny right down into those two. We come into the community housing side here, and that's where LHA gets involved. Lethbridge Housing Authority has community housing, so rent geared to the client. We have 676 units. We have 535 rent supplements, another 107 supplements that are funded through our city. And we have Treaty 7 housing. Okay, I think Treaty 7 housing might have 30 units. Well, I don't even know if that they have 30, maybe 20. And then we moved this affordable housing piece. So, um, and that's where, you know, the numbers really open up. Lethbridge housing has 183. We have that temporary rental assistance benefit. Green Acres comes into play under the affordable housing, Aboriginal housing, and then of course some co-op housing and some other housing. So it's really important when we're having conversations in our city, and we hear it all the time, and we hear it lots federally, provincially, you know, in our municipality, we need more affordable housing. We need more affordable housing. We don't. What we need, well, we always need more affordable housing. But what we need is appropriate housing to support clients to get them from that far side of that continuum over without them falling out of it. Right now, we're taking individuals out of homelessness, we're moving them all the way over to that affordable housing piece because we're so tight for space with that housing continuum. We're trying to get supports around them, but you know, COVID, people were working from home. Uh, so we're trying to move them from that far end all the way almost to that other end, and then we're wondering why they're not succeeding. They're not succeeding because we don't have the appropriate housing for them. So I really encourage individuals to start a conversation, not around affordable housing, but around appropriate housing. Our homeless individuals, you can't take them off the street when they've been street lived for 10 years or 20 years and put them in a home and think that they're going to keep it tidy and neat and they're gonna go grocery shopping and they're gonna make themselves some dinner and they're gonna do all of those things the rest of us do every day because that's just normal what we do. That's not how their brain works. That's not how they've operated for the last number of years. 
you know, we, we do such an amazing job with our seniors, and I've said this a million times, you know, we, we recognize that as people age, you know, maybe we're not taking care of ourselves as much as we need to. Maybe we're having a sandwich for supper, uh, you know, for, Maybe we need some help with some housekeeping. So we, we have these great lodges and we put our seniors, hey, you know, look at this great lodge. You're going to get some, some dinner here. They're going to make you three meals a day. They're going to come change your bedding. They're going to check on you. We're going to put some home care in place. And then as our seniors become more in need, we actually transition them into, you know, a, a dementia lodge if they need to or some sort of a special care lodge where we say you know what your brain isn't working the way it's not as supposed to so we recognize that we need to keep you safe we're going to put you somewhere where we can keep you safe we're going to feed you three meals a day we want to make sure you don't freeze to death when you lose your way but we don't do that to our homeless people and we don't do that to our people in need and we really need to refocus that and we really need to look at these housing with supports for individuals whose brains aren't really working the way they need to work and may never work the way they need to work. And we need to look at them a lot like how we treat our seniors because people are people regardless of their age and regardless of their need and regardless of why their brain doesn't work, it doesn't. So we do need to um, develop that housing and uh, get it delivered as soon as possible. So our application, my time is up in five minutes. Yeah, thank you. So our application to the city of Lethbridge was for um, unrestricted supportive housing. We're trying to move down that continuum as much as we can. We had applied um, in December before the cold weather snap. We were trying to beat it, we didn't. Um, we were applying for um, unrestricted supportive housing at two of our, our buildings. Um, and unfortunately, that was delayed. And um, we're looking at making some changes to that application now. We heard from our neighbors they're not happy with the idea of um, direct control. So we took that back and we said, OK, we are good neighbors. We're, we are good neighbors everywhere we are. We are throughout your community and you don't even know we're there. Our grass is cut, our toys are picked up, our people are taken care of. We do a, we do a heck of a good job in this city. I, I think we're amazing. Um, so let's just continue that. So I met with my neighbors and said, what do you need from me? And they said, well, we don't mind you, but we don't like direct control. So I said, okay, let's compromise. So recently, we've um, asked the city to provide us with, instead of our zoning change, we're actually going to pull back our zoning change. We're going to apply for a development permit at those two buildings, and we're going to apply for 24 units each building of supportive housing. And our neighbors, all of our neighbors that we talked to, all of those individuals that um, spoke against my project, up to this point, the ones that I've met with have all agreed to not only support me, but come and talk on our behalf or write a letter on our behalf. So we will get there as a community. We just have to make sure that we keep um, working together and uh, keep all of this in mind. So thank you for your time, and if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Robin. That uh, makes a lot of sense what you talked about, and uh, hopefully we will get there. Anyway, uh, feel free to ask questions, and I hope you all do as many as possible anyway, and if you can line up along the wall, that would be great. Uh, keep your, you know, your preamble reasonably short and focused, and ask topics on the, you know, ask, ask about what we're talking about here. Don't go on a big tangent about what else you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and once, once you've asked your question, I would encourage you to return to your seat because, and, and maybe when you ask a question to uh, kind of face the camera rather than I know you're supposed to look people in the eye, but <laughs> face the camera rather than the, than the speaker, because this makes a bet for a better TV show when you do that. <laughs> so anyway, 
feel free and uh, Robin if you would uh, come up and maybe maybe if you stand there then people have more reason to look you in the eye okay. than if you stand <laughs> back here so if you stand over there that'll be perfect okay, okay first question Leona Jacobs thank you for this because it there's, I didn't know the spectrum of housing, so that's good. Uh, but my question, which I had before and I still have, is what is direct control? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a darn million dollar question. It depends if you ask a lawyer or a planner. Um, so direct control, uh, there's specifically why we asked for it, it allows us to do a specific um, type of uh, housing, which the city has defined as supportive housing unrestricted. So direct control means we can fall under certain, fall under different permits. So right now, without direct control, I can only do 24, up to 24 beds. With direct control, I could do more than 24 beds. So that was the ask. Um, and the reasoning is because Castle Apartments, the one that we asked for, it has 79 units. And Helmrest Manor over here has 142 rent geared to income units. So that's why we were asking, because of the building size. Does that help? Hi, my name is Bob Campbell. Thank you, Robin. Excellent presentation. We were on committees together, that's why she kept saying, anyway, I'm old, that's why she kept asking me. Knowledge <laughs> The question I have for you, we've had other uh, proposals over the years for different uh, agencies to help out with our whole situation, including the mustard seed, which currently is in Edmonton, Calgary, Red Deer, Medicine Hat, but we have rejected it in this city. Could you just comment briefly on what the dynamics were and why that didn't take off here? Okay. Thank you for the question. And, and before I answer it, um, those who don't know, which you probably do know, but Bob Campbell has been just a shining star a, in our homeless population. He served on, uh, yeah, social housing in action for years. And uh, he, he led the way uh, for so long. And as a young, uh, young woman starting out in this business, uh, to be able to look to a gentleman like that was quite a privilege. So. Um, to answer that question, uh, zoning. The, it was a, a lack of zoning. They are still, we met with the Mustard Seed, we actually toured their Red Deer location. Um, they are still very willing to come to our city. Um, the province did put money on the table for them to come. There is, uh, I believe it was released, it's public information, a million dollars was available for a sober shelter in the city of Lethbridge, um, but we can't get it zoned. <laughs> um, why? Um, because no one wants it by them. Not my background. Yeah, there's lots of that. There's lots of misunderstanding um, around it. Um, y you know, in order for the mustard seed to be successful and for individuals to live in sobriety, they do need to be strategically placed. Um, for a variety of reasons. We know that there's lots of like little places in our downtown core that would, they would struggle to be successful because of the um, amount of abuse that's taking place in our downtown core. So um, they operate a really nifty model in Calgary uh, where they actually bus. So the um, sober shelter itself is actually in their industrial park. And um, they bus their individuals with the city to the downtown busing terminal. And then from there, the individuals that are staying at the shelter can actually take the train or the bus to go to work or to do activities. Or maybe if they have to go see an H worker or someone like that in the downtown core, they have access to that transport. And then in the evening, just before dinner time, they actually come back downtown to that downtown core bus station and pick everybody up and take them back out to the industrial park where they stay for the night and uh, are fed meals. And at the same time, if they don't have anything they need to do in town that day or they don't have a job, they are welcome to stay at the mustard seed and um, get their three meals a day. So maybe that'll work. <laughs> Uh, 
Hi, my name is Tom Moffat. Uh, I was wanting to ask a question on the affordable housing side of the spectrum. Um, it seems to me that um, in order to make housing more affordable for the people that are going to use it, one of the primary things to do nowadays would be to uh, invest in solar panels and geothermal heating so that there were no utility bills for the tenants that uh, take on that housing. And I was wondering, um, what's the view on that sort of thing in the housing world? Yeah. So uh, our new 64 units is fully solar paneled, uh, triple pane windows, spray foam insulation um, for exactly that. Um, in the community housing in the government owned properties, there's actually legislation that says that um, the individual living in that property is only um, responsible for their electricity. They're not responsible for any of the other bills. That's paid for by um, Lethbridge Housing Authority. So the heat, the water, the garbage, that sort of thing. Um, so we, uh, we limit it. If you're in an apartment, the most we can charge you um, and the most we can charge a senior is currently $50. That's legislated. Um, and then at the community housing level, when you have your own meter, you just pay what you use. But uh, yeah, there has been over time some programming coming out with some um, efficiencies attached to them. But as we're building, we're seeing that we can get more grant funding if we're using energy efficiencies. And so we took full advantage of that. So I would encourage you, if you haven't seen our um, complex on uh, South Cape Boulevard, to take a look. It's directly behind Lowe's, so right east of Lowe's. And it's, it's a fully solar paneled. So we are moving to that. Hi, Robin. Great job. Hi, Thank Rob. you. Rob Miyashiro, I'm LSEO and former city councillor. So just, just to clarify something um, that I think needs to be said, it's not just the zoning issue that happened with Mustard Seed for two facilities they tried to bring into Lethbridge. Part of it was um, community uh, connection and community engagement. So when, when council um, denied those two applications because of what was said at the public hearings, it was because there was a, um, there almost seemed to be some kind of um, predetermination by Mustard Seed that they could just come in and do this um, without spending a whole bunch of time in the community, in the neighborhoods. This was a, a question that was asked to the, the people around the Lakeview area about the Ramada um, and that they, there wasn't much engagement and the people from Mustard Seed admitted that. They were sound ideas. So we need to separate the sound idea from the process that needs to be undertaken in order to get that sound idea in place. Um, what Robin talked about, about, about putting that kind of housing lot, which is a sound idea. It's a great idea. And, and Robin did engage the community. And, and I think part of this is something that needs to be addressed in the um, land use bylaw review is maybe they need to take direct control out. Some of my um, friends and former colleagues on council don't like, don't like direct control as a, as a land use. So if they don't like it, they need to take it out and put in something that's a bit more, um, a bit more effective. So I, I guess the, the question is um, to you, is um, what do you want us to do? What do you want us as a community to do to, to advocate for those changes to land use, to advocate for uh, the proper housing for people that need it, the proper support of housing for people that need it? Um, be, because all, a, a vast majority of the social problems we have in our, in our community are related to addictions and housing. And if we can fix some of those, we can spend more time focusing on problems other people have that might not be so urgent, but are necessary for people to get on with their lives. So what can we do? Thanks for the question, Rob. So what we need to do is have lots of conversations around that, that second piece of housing there, uh, or the, sorry, the third piece, the transitional housing. That's going to be impactful. Transitional housing is where we can get you out of that emergency shelter and immediately start dealing with your needs. So is it an addiction? Is it a mental health? Um, is it a brain injury? Is it a developmental delay that uh, before you were born, like FASD? We can start identifying that and triaging that. So we need to have lots of conversations uh, um, with our counselors around 
land use bylaws, which is a really great point to bring up. And if you're not going to give out direct control, then change the dang name and make it something else that you'll give us so that we can get to work. Because I really need to get to work because there's lots of people outside and it's really cold. So um, that's, that's number one. And, and number two, let's change the conversation around affordable housing to appropriate housing with supports. So let's really, really impact that change in that conversation. Hi, Robin, and thank you for, Henning Mundel is my name, and thank you for your presentation, and really that chart is very informative. While in talking about this continuum and the situation of the homeless and how they move forward, very much the assumption is that the main ingredients are funding. You very nicely refer to you can't just take a person from off the street and assume they can do the, the shopping, the looking after and so on. My question is what agency or groups does Lethbridge Housing Authority work with to help people make those kinds of transitions? So first I'll speak specifically to what the Housing Authority does and then I'll speak to what the city does. So city context and LHA context, very different. So LHA, um, right now we work with organizations and actually one of the really cool things that I'm going to brag about and since universities here um, is our building brains. So um, we, and I'm going to go on a tangent for one minute. So. I was sitting in a meeting and the U of L was in the meeting and they said, you know, we've got this funding for this really cool project called Building Brains and it's supposed to be impactful on these young children under the age of five, right Kayla? Under five, but we just can't get these at-risk five-year-olds. Where are they? And I said, oh, I, I have a pile of them. <laughs> I have 273 units full of them. <laughs> They're everywhere. And they said, uh, can we come to you? And I said, of course. So I think it was developed by Dr. Robin Gibb. And um, it's this amazing program. And they come out to our community housing. And they do um, um, building through play, or learn through play. I'm not very good at explaining it. Kayla's better. Um, and and they, they engage our little under five-year-olds, which brings out the seven-year-olds and the 12-year-olds. And then it brings out the moms. And it starts engaging our families in a way that's um, I'm teaching them. So we're trying to get those supports in our community housing, in our senior self-contained and in our um, over 50 housing. Uh, the supports we put in specific to Lethbridge housing, we put in a fee-for-service agreement with the city um, where we have people called community workers that are actually in the building. So they will help our individuals with day-to-day -day things, accessing income supports, accessing age, getting your seniors benefits done on time so that there's not a gap between the time you stop your age or your income support benefits and your seniors benefits start. Um, helping with food security, we do um, food programs in our large high rises uh, twice a month you know, in conjunction with the soup kitchen. Um, so they can do a food exchange, the soup kitchen brings us a bunch of extra food, we deliver it out to those clients and when we have even more extra we take it in our vans and in our personal cars if you're Kayla and you go to the community housing and you knock on everyone's doors and say I have hamburger <laughs> would you like some and they oh they're very grateful so we do have some of those things in place through an organization like the U of L and through the fee-for-service programming at the city of Lethbridge um, on the city of Lethbridge side, the homeless side, the city of Lethbridge, I think, is given, I think the grant funding agreement for homelessness is $4.2 million a year. And their job is to send that out into the, into the city and have services provided to the, to the homeless. Because, of course, the city doesn't provide the services themselves. So on a city context, it's organizations like Canadian Mental Health Association, um, YWCA, I'm having a blank moment, um, Family Ties Through River House, um, Southern Alberta Self-Help Association, those types, I'm missing a pile, but you kind of get the idea. So just, th that's a Lethbridge context and the LHA context. Mm. 
My name is Mary Shillington. As a retired social worker, I thought about your uh, the that the people need the supports, and you answered uh, with uh, Henning's uh, question quite a bit of that. But how do we get that information out to the community and to uh, people who would like to volunteer or would do it in paid situations? To, to offer that support so that people can move from being out on the streets into into something more structured for them that's going to fit for them. So. Yeah. so you're asking how we get that information out to, to yeah. kind of... So at this point, and I'm going to walk away from the microphone for one minute. All of this? is the role of the city, okay? The role of the CBO currently, funded by the provincial government, but the role of the city. On the other side, so the city, so my answer to you in current context is the city needs to get this information out. I'm going to act in the best interests of my clients and the clients I serve by trying to present to individuals who are willing to listen to me and thank you for having me um, to get this information out. Um, and. Part of our business planning um, in this next 2023 year for Lethbridge Housing will be, you know, getting these information, getting this information out. You know, we've we've always been my predecessor or prior to me. You know, we didn't have LHA decals on things. We didn't we didn't speak at a lot of different um, things, and we, people didn't know who we were. So. We always wanted to blend. We wanted no one to drive by one of our complexes and say that's where the poor people live. Um, and we still, we still don't. So we, we just need to get, the city does this through community engagement. They invite you to City Hall every once in a while. Um, we do it through uh, our board. But again, we, we do need to do a better job. And current context, the city needs to be doing the engagement. I'm Mark Gettle. In Lethbridge, there seems to be a big blame game going on, especially if you read the roasts and toasts. <laughs> and one of them, of course, is that the supervised consumption center is bl to blame for the emergency, uh, for the homelessness. And then also people saying, if you build more emergency centers, you're just going to attract more undesirables. And then also one could say that, you know, if you get a lot more affordable housing, you're going to attract people here because it's cheaper to live here than somewhere else. So I'd like, just like you to comment on that and set that straight a bit, what your feelings about all this negativism that's coming out, okay. especially since the taxes went up. So, oh my God, I'm not going to be paying for that, right? And you're, and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. Alberta, Alberta is. Alberta is. Sorry. Um, so, you know, I think that the reality is it, this, some people are going to hate this part and some people aren't but the reality is people do move to communities for services so we do see these types of behaviors uh, people move to cities for kidney dialysis my grandparents my grandma was on kidney dialysis we, you know she didn't there was no kidney dialysis in Lethbridge where you got to go you got to go to Calgary people move to communities for services so when you have services available people will move to your city for services that's a fact that's never going to stop it happens all the time. We have a, how many students move to Lethbridge to attend the U of L, to attend LCC? People move to communities for services. So we need to recognize that, and that's okay. We need to really stop. Um, where am I trying to go with this? We really need to start looking at the people that are in our community, regardless of where they came, we need to look at what supports they need. We need to provide those supports, we need to put them in place, and then we need to continue on. It, no one's gonna get better, and no one's going to come into the tax base as a taxpayer, as, a, as an individual, unless they can come through this continuum of housing. So if we really want to see our community succeed, even if they come in on that far end, they can still come out on this other end, right? So, so even if they do come to our community for services, you know, let's get the services in place, let's bring them through. Hey, 
we need staff here too, you know. My friends own some businesses in town. They need workers. You know, there's lots of great things about Lethbridge. I think we need, I'm probably not answering the question the way you want it answered, but the reality is people come to cities for services, that's a reality. We need to provide some services. We need, we need to get this done. Bev Mendel-Atherstone. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I was at City Council one day for nine hours and uh, managed to hear Robin's presentation, which I thought was just spectacular. And uh, I'm, I'm struck also by your continuum here of services. And I've gone to City Council community engagement events and spoken with city councillors and now I realize it wasn't shelters I was talking about, it was transitional housing. Because I see so many, so many buildings downtown on the north side that are heated, beautiful buildings. The old Save on Foods on the north side, the old Safeway. There's all kinds of buildings. And my idea was <clears throat> you could use this building have little rooms all around the edge with lockable rooms because that's one of the big problems with people in shelters is they lose their items, their items are stolen or broken or whatever. And inside this big gigantic place have all kinds of services. So I suggested this to various counselors and they told me, oh, the providers have to come with, up with this plan and bring the plan to us. And I thought, well, shouldn't the city be saying what they need? and recommending providers to come and provide these services. So I'd like to know if you have some insight into this process so that when I go and talk to city council members again, I can be clearer on what is the role of the city and what is the role of the provider. So the role of the city is the big picture at this point. Um, ideally, and I, I, I know that there's a counselor here and she's, all, she's at lots of our events and we do appreciate that she participates. Um, ideally, I would like to see housing and homelessness together, just like the ministry has put it together. I think that a seamless housing and homelessness together delivered through one organization in a similar fashion to Medicine Hat would be far more impactful than what we're doing now. The role of the city is to be the big picture thinker. How do we keep people out of homelessness or make their homelessness brief? That's what they're supposed to do. How they're supposed to deliver it, it's back on that slide, so I'll go back. Oh, no, I'll go forward, I lied. Um, so literally, they're supposed to, their job and what they do, and they uh, engage the community, um, is to you know, determine the needs, establish the priorities for our community, in sync with the province, create the goals, uh, fund the programs. So what do we need? That's up to the CBO provides the large vision. The actual action plan is the service provider. How we provide it is the service provider. Does that answer the question? So the city is the macro, the service providers are the micro. Hi, my name is David Major and I appreciate your talk this afternoon. But I, speaking from a, a vast fund of ignorance, I, I don't know who, who becomes homeless. Can you describe that for me? And if you can, how do we intervene to prevent them from becoming homeless in the first place? Yeah, very good question. So our, our homeless population is primarily addicted and has mental health issues in our city. A large number of our individuals that are homeless in our city are also FASD. So the FASD we can't prevent, um, but we could, at the children's services level, ensure that there are transition plans in place before those individuals turn 16 and can make their own decisions. Um, so that's something you could do that could be really impactful is um, 
advocate to the Ministry of, Seeing, uh, of Children's Services. We need to have some plans in place for these young people when they're born with FASD. They can't just be turned out into the world um, after they're done foster care and hey, good luck, you know. Uh, so that that's a prevention piece. Um, the other prevention piece I think the province has been doing very well on recently is the um, treatment centers because we do have a large number um, that are highly addicted. Um, so access to, to treatment is huge uh, for our city. And there's been a, a recent announcement in the last few months of um, quite a bit of money, and I can't remember exactly how much, into mental health supports. So preventatively speaking, we need to start at our youth, um, the youth in care specifically. Um, and really, anyone's child you know, can, can become addicted. So my child is addicted. Um, we've been struggling uh, in our home with, with an addicted child for 10 years. So um, it doesn't matter uh, how much you love them and how much you hug them and, and how educated they are and how much money you make. Um, they still experience trauma. And it's out of our control as parents. So as providers, wearing my other hat, not mom, but my LHA hat, we need to make sure that when that trauma is experienced and they fall into that addiction, that we have not only the uh, support in place for the addiction, but the counseling in place for the trauma. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Ian Hurdle. I have one comment and one question. I think if you can move people along into transitional housing and we got them off the street, the amount that you would say for EMS, policing, uh, robberies, break-ins, etc., would be quite significant. My question is, where do you think the blood tribe will go with the a shelter and what are your hopes for that? So I'm really excited um, that the Blood Tribe has taken this role. This is this is huge. Blood Tribe has access to so many services um, on on reserve. They have a, a youth ranch. They have a bringing the spirit home program. Um, they have all those cultural supports there. I, I think that it's it's such a huge opportunity for our, for our individuals that are experiencing homelessness to have those appropriate cultural supports in place. So I'm very very hopeful. Um, they've got some strong people uh, that are helping guide that program and and some really strong leaders there. So I'm very very hopeful that as as I build what I need to build and they do their part we can actually start seeing a, a true continuum in our city so this will be our last question so don't go away <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Barb Phillips. Uh, I'm a newbie to Lethbridge, 10 years, so nothing like Bob. So I don't know all the past history, but I do know in the 10 years as an engaged citizen, it's kind of been frustrating. In Lethbridge, you seem to take one step forward and then a couple back. As recently as last week, we had a warming shelter, and now we don't have a warming shelter because the temperature warmed up, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, what can we, a lot of the people in this room are, fall into this category, engaged citizens of Lethbridge, what can we do? Because short of taking water down to Galt Gardens, I don't know what we can do. Can't write letters to the editor or you'll get beat up. <laughs> Can't do toast and roast with a toast because then you'll really get beat up. So what can we do? Thank you. So I think um, as much as we can lobby our council members uh, to get this continuum of housing up and running as quickly as possible is huge. And the other thing we really can do, and, and, and I've said it a million times and I'll say it a million more, we need to meet people where they're at, but we don't need to leave them there. We need to bring them through this continuum. So please continue to have those conversations um, at a provincial level if you have some provincial um, 
individuals that you're engaged with at a municipal level. Um, any kind of um, excitement we can create around fulfilling this more housing continuum. You, know, you can see the total numbers there. You can see as soon as it hits, as soon as it hits that community housing, we're in we're a thousand units. But when we're trying to take 450 people out of homelessness, we're at 112. So appropriate housing, appropriate housing, not affordable housing, appropriate housing with supports. So thank you.